Hey, welcome to BJJ Mental Models, episode 16. I'm Steve Kwan. I am Matt Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent BJJ approach. So today's episode is kind of an evolution of what we talked about last time. We touched on force vectors and leading edges, and we're getting pretty deep into particular key strategies for retaining and managing guard. Something we've talked about in previous episodes is the concept of phases of guard. This is something that I wasn't really exposed to until I started reviewing Rob's models and talking to you, Matt, about Rob's way of thinking about the guard. Most of us, when we think about guard, we think of a position like, you know, closed guard, open guard, Delhi Heva guard. But in reality, it's actually a lot richer and more complicated than that. Um, Rob thinks of this as three distinct phases of guard. So the first phase is the engagement phase, meaning uh, we have not yet made first contact. We're in the process of, you know, establishing grips and determining what this guard is going to look like. Uh, And this also applies to stand up as well, right? You know, Mm -hmm. before two people have touched, how do they get their grips and what happens next? The second phase of guard is maintenance. And Matt, you can chime in here if I'm incorrect correct or misspeaking on any of these things, but maintenance meaning, okay, we've got our grips. We're now basically jockeying for who has the dominant position here. Mm -hmm. So it's somewhat neutral at this point. You know, there's, everyone has a good degree of alignment. No one has run away with the clear advantage. Retention is where you are in the process now of getting past. You're usually, or you've been past. yeah, Yeah. Yeah. Usually this means your opponent has gotten past your legs, which in most guards and situations, situations are going to be your first line of defense. So now you're in a scramble to get your guard back um, before they settle into a more dominant position like side control or start advancing to the mount. Mm -hmm. So these three distinct phases have different strategies along the way. And this is a very important thing to understand. And most people that I have uh, rolled with and and instructed with don't actually teach this. So this is a, a big hole in the knowledge base that most practitioners play under. You know, we think of guard as kind of a single thing and maybe there's a few different variants of it, but really we need to teach each of these phases independently. So for the next three episodes, our hope is to cover each of these different phases separately. Today's focus, we're going to talk explicitly about engagement. Matt, anything you want to chime in there with? Yeah. So um, we are discussing these phases of guard as, as, though they specifically pertain to uh, just playing guard in jiu-jitsu. But um, like you said, you know, these these phases of, uh, of, of, quote, guard apply to pretty much all contact or sorry, all combat sports. Um, you know, when we talk about stand up, things like judo, wrestling, uh, sometimes to the to the untrained eye, these sports can appear boring and kind of, um, you know, it looks like each, each opponent is stalling each other out, but that's because they're very careful about how they enter. And once they're, they know that once their opponent gets a dominant grip on their wrist or on their gi in a certain way, um, now they can take that fight where they want it. So it, they constantly are hand fighting. Lots of hand fighting is going on. And they're basically v- being very uh, frugal about how they want to uh, proceed into the next phase. They know that if they get out gripped, they want to essentially just break the grip and restart again. Uh, and this is this is kind of something that's really helped me um, become a better guard player and become a better wrestler. Uh, same thing if you're doing striking, you know, when you're, when you're out of range and you're trying to find that range where you can land, uh, the strike that you want to land, you, you know, that's the engagement phase. And then when you get into, into the range where you can actually put your hands on someone or they can hit you, uh, that that's going to be sort of the, uh, the maintenance phase per se. Right. And, um, you could even take this one step further and think in terms of, you know, like uh, police operations or SWAT operations, they also think in terms of ranges. Like when they're dealing with someone who who might have a weapon, you know, they they understand that if you're standing close to them, that uh, you're you're if you have a sidearm, that might not be as effective as your your opponent's knife, right? So the way that you can 
essentially buy yourself time and and safety is by creating space between yourself and the assailant. So it's it, it, it's a rule that applies not just to jiu-jitsu when we're speaking of guard, but also takedowns, striking, any combat situation. Uh, we want to think about these different phases of our guard so that we can specifically break down those phases. And we're essentially uh, isolating different layers of guard. Yeah, that's a really excellent way of explaining this. And it touches back on the fact that this, this mental model can be expanded beyond just jujitsu. Now we're going to talk about it in the context of jujitsu, meaning, you know, how, how do you break down the phases of guard? But really, if you want to talk about the phases of a fight or even uh, at a higher level, the phases of any type of conflict, you're going to see this kind of pattern. When you take a self-defense course, the first thing they teach you, or, or at least the first thing that they should teach you if it's a good self-defense course, is the best way to survive a fight is prevention to not even yeah. get into the situation where a fight could happen yeah. you know rap before you start worrying about like uh, you know gun uh, you know gun defense or knife defense the best way to it's the worst thing yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that's that's like the last possible uh, option for you the better thing to do is just to not walk down that dark alley or not to go into that club and get into that altercation right and that's really what the engagement phase is about in jiu-jitsu you you haven't necessarily made contact with your opponent yet you are in the process of doing that and that is what is going to dictate what happens next in the fight. Um, the engagement phase is criminally overlooked in most training that people talk about and, and in fact there is kind of a, a habit that we all get into where you know when we're training in class we slap hands we bump fists and then we both just immediately grab the the, the old judo grip on each other right uh, this happens both from standing and a lot of the time from guard where you know oh, okay slap hands bump fists and now we both get our grips and now we go that's a massive massive mistake because by doing that you're denying yourself the opportunity to train what is actually probably the most important phase of guard yeah you, you would never want to set yourself at a disadvantage when you're in competition or you know if you're trying to complete a project uh, as a student or in the business world you always want to set everything in your favor you want to be prepared and that pretty much pertains to the engagement phase of things. You always want to set yourself up for success, what, no matter what you're trying to accomplish. And if you're just going in with, uh, you know, no concept of gripping, you're just going to start in someone's half guard and then we're going to begin or, or start in someone's guard. It, you know, you, you might get good roles, but at the same time, you're not really, especially if you're a competitor, you're, you're essentially doing this wrong. And, uh, if you're, if you're, are, um, just a recreational practitioner, you're also ignoring a huge part Part, which is the hand fighting so that's going to be up to your instructor to fully understand that there are layers of guard and then they need to be able to pass that information on to you and to set exercises in class that isolate that one in that one range battle of hand fighting so that you can develop an understanding of trying to win the grip fighting and uh, managing the distance. Yeah, it's this is something that my instructor used to do to me that I used to hate where, you know, we would we'd be rolling and I'd be um, I'd be on the bottom and we'd slap hands and he would immediately just pass my guard. Like, you know, it w wouldn't do, you know, I'd be sitting there wanting to, to, to get my grips and doing like the friendly, okay, let's both get our grips and you just slap hands and just pass me. And it's annoying, but after a while I realized, well, these teachers teaching me a lesson here you know yeah. it's that i i am i am trying to skip to phase two of guard and he's trying to play phase one of guard and if you have that mindset the guy who wants to play the engagement phase is always going to win yeah I, there's um th th there's something that keenan cornelius calls tempo and i don't know if tempo is the word that i would use to describe it but it's essentially creating a situation where you are uh, throwing different dilemmas at your partner and they are forced to now deal with multiple problems at once and what this usually results in is them getting their guard passed or getting in a bad position or even getting submitted so um, if the person on top can beat you to the punch and get their grips or they've immediately started passing your legs and they're forcing you to essentially just frame and try and defend uh, they're dominating that position and that and that's where you need to know on the bottom hey like I actually lost that first battle so instead of me thinking how can I get my guard back at this point you want to think even further ahead to okay how did how did my partner use this you know quote tempo to uh 
to pass my guard and to create such an advantageous situation. So if I can look back at that and think about uh, where things went wrong, you know, maybe they threw my legs to the side and didn't even grip up with me, or maybe they took like a cross grip on my pant leg and another grip on my collar. And from there, they're able to pivot me. You know, once they establish those grips and I, I uh, wasn't able to grab their sleeves or anything, that's where I screwed up. Not when they passed my guard. And mm -hmm. it's not that I need to think about how do I escape but more, how do I prevent? Yeah. Right? An, an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure, they say. Yeah. It's cool. like, you know, it's like, how do you get out of $100,000 of crushing debt? Well, if you have the option, the better way, the best way to do that is not to get that debt in the first yeah. place, right? Invest it's, smarter, have, have better strategies from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. It's always better to walk around the hole than to fall into it and then have to worry about digging yourself out. Um, so once, once we get into the future episodes, we will, of course, talk about how you dig yourself out, but it's far better to... to not get into that situation in the first place. As far as tempo goes, I, I, I like that term a lot, uh, but you know, other people have used other language, you mm -hmm. know, the, probably the more common term for what you're talking about is like dictating the pace yeah. or dilemma. Yeah. Uh, Dan Hur calls it dilemma. Yeah. Right? And, you know, or, you know, the old saying is the best defense is a good offense. What, what you're really talking about in either of these cases is one of you is, is basically leading. It's like dancing, right? One of you is leading and the other one is following and in a fight you always want to be the one that's leading because if the other person is able to dictate the pace then you're always one step behind them and you're always focusing on being reactive to them and in life if you are in a situation where all of your behavior is just reactive to what someone else is doing that is a terrible place to be yeah i'll, I'll say as a jiu-jitsu competitor of almost 10 years now i've realized that i'd say probably about God, probably 95% of the matches that I've lost have been due to me trying to be a counterfighter. Mm -hmm. Basically trying to roll how I roll in the gym. Because when you're in the gym, you know, it's fun to just be a counterfighter. You catch each other. Uh, you you want to play off your opponent's uh, offense and sort of see, see the, create a reaction time and sort of, you know, develop a, a sensitivity to, to uh, react and counter what they're doing. But in a match, if you are... Um, complacent and if you are uh, I don't know if docile is the word, the word but passive you know, over, kind of like over you're, passive. Yeah, you're letting the other yeah. person tell the story of exactly. how this match is going to go if, if you play like that in a competition especially at like the black belt level a lot of the time you're going to end up on the losing edge you, you might it might be a close match but when when matches are won and lost sometimes on, adva on advantages and penalties and such close margins uh you know, you really want to make sure that you start to develop ways to go for it. So, like you said, a good, a good offense is a, or the, the best defense is a good offense. Mm -hmm. You know, you, sometimes you don't want to just be defensive. You want to be able to create an offensive strategy. A lot of the time when we're talking about engagement phase, what that means is, you know, I need to get control of my opponent's levers. I need yeah. to get control of their sleeves or, the, you know, get a two-on-one on one of their arms. I need to create uh, control on one of their levers so that I can start manipulating manipulating them. Otherwise, they're going to start controlling your levers or your head and they're going to create a situation where they're all of a sudden creating dilemmas for you. They're passing your guard and uh, things go really south when all you can do are, are, is frame and try and regard. You're, you're not winning that match. Yeah, you've already put yourself in a massive disadvantage and now you're trying to dig yourself out of that hole when you would have been better off just not getting there in the first place. This ties into something, uh, you know, a mental model that I, I think we've talked about before, which is training with purpose. You know, you always want to consciously go into a situation knowing what your strategy and your mindset are going to be because when you're training in class, that mindset can be very different from when you're actually in a fight, right? You know, when I when I am training with in class, especially when I'm training with uh, more junior people, which is 90% of the time that is the case, right? I'm not going in there trying to crush people with my A game, right? I, I'm usually intentionally trying to eliminate moves that I, I think that I'm comfortable with and focus on things that I'm not. Or, you know, maybe I will pull guard um, even though I, I don't necessarily want to simply because I want to work from the bottom because I always want to... 
I'm more of a defensive player in a lot of ways. But if you walk into an actual fight or competition with that mindset, you know, you're you're basically seeding an opportunity to win. Uh, you have to, and it's okay to have different mindsets for different situations, but you need to consciously think about what is the mindset I've got to have right now and make sure that you're equipped to utilize that mindset, right? You don't want to go into a competition and be like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm just going to kind of wander into this and subconsciously just pull a guard or just sit, <laughs> yeah, just, just sit down because that's what I've done the last thousand times I've trained, right? Yeah. And it takes like, if, if you are thinking about competition or maybe you're an active competitor who's struggling and you're trying to find out how you can improve your competition game i mean <laughs> you gotta you really gotta be self-critical and you gotta say to yourself you know am i thinking about what i'm gonna do am i is my is my game willing to adapt mid-match which which is something that god knows i've struggled with it i've lost a lot of matches because i wasn't able to adapt part way through the match and decide okay my guard isn't working against this guy he's you know the clock's running down i've got to get up maybe i should just stand up maybe i should mm -hmm. try try something guard. else right and that and that takes confidence and it takes commitment mm -hmm. and it takes conditioning right so these are th these are things that are difficult to do mid-match when all you when you know you're you, you, another thing about uh uh, training with purpose is you, it's very difficult and it takes a lot of practice and mental strength to to um, to not be worried about what your your opponent's going to do to you right yeah. to, ha to know what you want to do and to uh, implement your game plan and not being passive and and you know because that can happen that can cause you to freeze up mid-match if you're if you're thinking oh my god what if he passes my guard and then i'm going to be down if you start going down those rabbit holes it's it's a it's not a good way to keep clarity in your mindset and it's it's not really a healthy competition uh, uh way to look at your game plan so definitely just remember that uh, passivity is going to cost you a lot of losses compared to being uh What's the word I'm looking for? Being um, overconf being confident with yourself. Yeah. Assertive really assertive is the way is, that, Yeah, that's yeah. a good way to the, put it. The way that I, you know, when I when I was a kid, I was always told, you know, there's there's three types of emotional strategies you can have. You can be passive, aggressive, or assertive. And assertive is usually best, right? Uh, that's the way it was always explained to me. And I, I think that's kind of the case in a lot of in a lot of these situations, right? You you want to be the dominant one. You don't now that doesn't mean you're totally out of control with aggression and you're just freaking out but it means that you know you are in control and you're dictating the pace and you're making things happen the way you want them to i like the example you provided about you know be having some degree of self-awareness and mindfulness and being able to take a step back and, and think uh and and realize okay the strategy i'm using right now is not working for me and i've got to pivot on the fly because i think a mistake a lot of people make is they kind of get tunnel vision when things aren't going their way and they start trying to just force the thing that they normally do whereas it takes a degree of mindfulness to be able to you know know take a step out of your own head and realize okay what i'm doing isn't working how can i pivot right now yeah a few weeks ago i fought a guy named keith kirkorian from 10th planet at a submission uh, washington submission series half you know the match was going great and i knew that uh it's an ebi rule set so it's a 10 minute submission only match followed by three rounds of overtime which you know i'm not a big fan of that uh, rule set but i do it because i know there's high level guys doing these competitions and they allow heel hooks but anyways you know during the match i, I pulled guard and I played pretty much guard the entire time. I was trying to get leg entanglements. He wasn't having any of it. And, uh, you know, I didn't have that foresight during the match to stand up and to try and make him pull guard and try and pass his guard. Instead, I just kept going for my entanglements from the bottom. And I mean, if it was a role in the gym, I would have been very pleased with how I did with him. I was very, it was super even. The match is on my YouTube channel. Uh, you can watch it there. Uh, but I, I realized like with a few minutes left, I'm like, okay, he's quite happy for this match to go to overtime. This yeah, yeah. overtime is where these guys uh, flourish. So, and, and I'm, I'm realizing by that point, I'm like, oh sh shit, like maybe I should have stood up there. And then it did go to overtime. And and, uh, you know, he, my overtime game fell apart. He had a stronger overtime game and I lost. I lost to over, due to over passivity and not being able to change my mindset mid match because it is difficult when someone is coming at you, attacking you. And, uh, you know, it, it takes a lot of, uh, mind mindfulness to be able to, to, 
to change your your game plan and it also takes uh, uh, some good coaching to remind you along the way right we do get tunnel vision in our matches sometimes and a lot of the in this case it was my detriment for sure yeah you know what what you're talking about there kind of the the option to stand up or sit down this is something that people very easily forget in the moment uh, but it can be a real game changer for you you know that that is almost unless your opponent is actually physically pinning you it is always an option to switch levels and sometimes you know especially if you're the guy on the ball and you get overly focused on, uh, I'm going to get the sweep, I'm going to get the sweep, and it's just not happening. And again, if you've got some mindfulness, you can kind of just get up and, and switch the angle. This can actually be very important for the engagement phase because while you're trying to, um, you know, establish, basically, you know, you probably don't have your grips yet when you're talking about the engagement phase, you can kind of head fake your opponent by going up or down in ways that they don't expect. And sometimes that can be a, a lot less obvious to them than you just walking in and trying to establish your grips. I mean, I, I do this kind of stuff a lot where if I think that my opponent thinks I want to stand with them, I'll just sit down. Or if I'm on the bottom and we're trying to establish grips, suddenly I'll just get up. And that kind of unpredictability can really put you in the driver's seat when it comes to defining the engagement phase and how that goes. Mm -hmm. and, and in jiu-jitsu, we tend to think of it as a defensive martial art. So the guard is a huge aspect of jiu-jitsu. So it is, it's really easy to just want to play off your back right mm -hmm. but definitely under a rule set where uh points really mean nothing and um there's an overtime situation as opposed to ibjjf where it's just going to be you know the ref's going to call who who won the fight based on positioning uh in case of no submission then you know, it's easy to to uh to sometimes not have the right game plan mm -hmm. and to to be over passive and to play guard possibly a bit too much so yeah yeah that's up to me as a competitor to make adjustments for next time right and you know if you if if all those competitors out there that are in a slump right now or are struggling to be successful th this is what it takes you have to look at what you did wrong what you could have done better and then make those realistic changes for next time right because mm -hmm. no one let's be honest no one really cares if you win or lose competitions unless they're at the highest level so there's always going to be another competition. There's always going to be, you know, more chances to prove yourself. So it's not like, you know, <laughs> it's not like people are going to remember me for this one loss or whatever. It's, uh, it's, uh, you just move on and move forward, win or lose. Yeah. Very, very rarely. I mean, unless it's like a, like, Keith Hackney, Joe Sun situation. Very rarely are people going to remember you for the way that you lost. <laughs> Is that the low blows? Yeah, that's where he, I think Keith Hackney just got side control and just repeatedly punched him in the junk enough times that he tapped out. That I've never seen a tap out by groin strikes before, and we probably never will again. If, if I'm not mistaken, Joe Sun got into some legal issues. I believe. Wasn't he, it like a child? I it was. Yeah, I think he's in jail for gang rape. <laughs> Something like that. He, didn't he also play uh, random? He, task he was random task in, in the Austin Power. Yeah, that, that, well, compared to his UFC career, that was definitely his finest work. Random task. Yeah. Um, and anyway, so back on the topic of engagement, uh, when when you're talking about the engagement phase, normally you're talking about um, effectively like controlling the distance and you're talking about grip fighting. That's most of what the engagement yeah. phase comes down to. Now, uh, standing or seated. Yeah, standing or seated. Uh, and yeah, and a lot of the time it will be stand up because if, you know, when you're talking engagement, when no one is making contact could very well be the beginning of the fight. It could also be where you're in the up, you know, the up down position where one person is standing and the other person is seated. Uh, but in any event, the, we've talked in the past about how grips dictate position. You know, the person who gets their dominant grips, that's probably going to be the person who starts immediately controlling the fight. If, if you want to talk about who's going to dictate the pace, usually the person who wins the grip fight is the person who is going to dictate the pace. And Matt, you mentioned earlier, uh, the concept of being frugal when you're in the engagement phase, which is so important to talk about because I, I think that you, a lot of us, you know, when we, when we want to get grips, we literally just like zombie walk right into our opponent and get our grips and we pay no mind to whether our opponent is gripping us back or whether they've got a better grip than us. We just kind of walk in and if we get our judo 50-50 grip, we're totally happy. And that is a not so good scenario because 
it, it denies you the opportunity to get an initial early advantage. Um, you know, in, with jujitsu, so much of good jujitsu looks like watching two cats fight. And if you've ever watched two cats fight, you know that at the beginning, which we have, um, as, as, as people who both own multiple cats, you know, you, you you see them and they basically just sit there and they kind of like hunch up and then they kind of like gently paw at each other. And then and that, that's kind of the engagement phase. And then suddenly they just go absolutely bananas, right? Um, that's that's kind of what it looks like when you see two black belts fight too, right? At the beginning, there's just a lot of like gentle pawing at each other because no one wants to just run in and possibly give up a grip to the opponent. But then as soon as one person thinks they've got the dominant grip, then it's on, right? Yeah. And that that's the mentality you want to have. You just don't want to wander in and be like, I got it. I'm going to just get this collar grip because then your opponent's going to do the same thing and you've lost the opportunity to take the lead. You want to make sure that you get the grip you want and your opponent does not get the grip that they want. Yeah, perfectly put. And and that's why, like we, we were discussing uh, judo, like it, I... A lot of the time I wasn't even thinking about my grips when I was first practicing my stand-up and then I actually started training with some really good judokas mm -hmm. and I realized like, okay, if I get out gripped here, I'm going for a ride yeah, pretty yeah. much instantly, right? And that's why when you watch Olympic judo, uh, it can look almost boring to, to some people. Until the bomb goes off. And then all of a sudden <laughs> yeah. a giant bomb goes off and someone goes flying for a pawn and, and that's, you know, what... what you know the olympic committee wants to see they want to see those big throws but mm -hmm. but there's a whole fight that goes on before the actual throw itself and that is fighting for the sleeve and the, you know in judo it, it would look like a sleeve and collar grip or you know maybe an overhand grip and mm -hmm. in wrestling it would be like a two-on-one uh wrist control or it'd be maybe a collar tie or or some other form of a you know a, a, like a russian tie or something like that so mm -hmm. there's there's all types of different grip battles depending on what what grappling situation or even combat sports yeah even, even striking discussing. right yeah. like i mean you granted in the case of striking you don't necessarily have uh worry so much about grips but there is uh you know you do want to make sure that you don't just wander in there you want to make sure that you're being frugal with the way that you've positioned your body yeah. there's and that comes down to footwork yeah 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 and you know one thing that is common in really any effective combat art is you adopt the staggered stance, right? You put one foot forward and one foot back and you, you do that for a variety of reasons. But one of the reasons that is especially relevant to grappling is you, you want to, in addition to being able to load up your power and to absorb force in more directions, you take a staggered stance because you want to reduce the, the areas where your opponent can attack, attack your body, right? You want to minimize the attack vectors that can come at you. If you just walk straight into your opponent, you know, with it being fully squared up, they can grab you or attack you anywhere. And that makes it very hard for you to predict what's going to happen. Whereas if you lead with one foot or lead with one arm, then you have a better idea of where the attack's going to come from. Something that I like to do when I'm standing up is I, you know, I try to, or even actually to some extent when I'm sitting down, I try to be very mindful of which parts of my body I'm exposing to, you know, towards my opponent. Like I will, uh, something that I do a lot when I'm standing up actually is I'll use one hand, I'll lead with one hand and try and get a grip, but I'll actually try, use my other hand to grab my own collar and pull it tight. Yeah. So that, um, then the reason I do that is because that way my opponent can't grab my collar and the only, yeah. there's one arm coming at them and they have to deal with that. So I'm kind of dictating the terms there. Now yeah. you're saying uh, you're, I'm giving you this one arm to try and grab. Yeah. And, and that is your only option yeah and it basically as soon as you do i'm going to try and regrip you exactly yeah, yeah. so it, you're kind of walking in on your terms it, that's not the only way to do things but uh, the important thing is you don't just want to like zombie walk into your opponent and get that 50 50 grip yeah. you want to make sure that you are you know you're keeping your and again this ties back to coiling your limbs you don't want to just like reach out and try to grab your opponent because yeah. then they might be able to it's arm, a broken structure yeah you, you're breaking your structure you're giving them control of your arm they might arm drag you they might get the dominant grip you want to keep your your elbows in tight you want to keep your 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 you know to some extent your chin down you want to keep you don't want to extend your legs and have them too exposed you want to keep yourself small and that allows you to make sure that when you get in towards your opponent they're not going to be able to just grab your arm and arm drag you right off the bat yeah like i think that this discussion about stance is very important when we're talking about engagement battles um 
one one of the things Danaher said was, you know, uh, you can tell someone's experience level roughly by the way that they hold their bodies. Like yeah. Their, what's their posture like? Is their head way up there? Are they are they sort of tucking their chin in? Are their arms outreached and wild, or are they sort of reserved and and more like uh, resembling T Rex arms where their structures are still strong? Mm-hmm. Uh, like tethering your elbows to your body is is generally something I try to do unless I'm fighting for grips then you you kind of have to give up your your levers to get some right yeah um and and you'll see you'll see situations where people do break rules like i i i adopt a staggered stance as well in wrestling quite commonly you'll see wrestlers stand with one leg forward and then they'll brace their lead arm on that knee just mm-hmm. to protect that knee from a from shot, a shot or yeah. be, be ready to underhook with that arm um but commonly if we're talking about striking arts you'll see boxers lead heavily with the, with one leg forward um of course in their sport they don't need to worry about taking leg kicks Mm -hmm. or anything like that so they they want to be very mobile and and be able to move in and out whereas thai boxers traditionally will will almost have a not a staggered stance like slightly staggered but mostly a a square stance because they want to have their shins available to check kicks Mm -hmm. so depending Mm -hmm. on the art and depending on what kind of strategies you're going to implement you're going to see a variety of stances but just thinking in terms of alignment, your a staggered stance is going to allow you to uh, absorb force and to exert force, right? Having having that base in all directions. So uh, generally, I keep a staggered stance as well when I'm in jujitsu, and um, you know, managing the distance, having footwork. That's something that's not just a stand up. Uh, it's not just exclusive to stand-up arts, but definitely for judo and for jiu-jitsu, you want to think about your footwork and what they're doing, not just how you're gripping. Yeah, and you know, fun fact, if you want to have a real quick way to evaluate the effectiveness of a martial art, if the martial art has a, a, a basic stance where you're basically just completely squared up to your opponent, probably not a, a super effective martial art. Like I, I've seen variants of like Wing Chun where they do that, where they just basically just like stand with both their feet completely even with each other. The problem with that is then you can't, you know, you can't absorb or, or create force in every single direction. Yeah. It's easy for your opponent to push you in certain directions. Yeah. And you're also exposing all of your body at once. Your opponent can do anything to any part of your body. And part of dictating the pace is reducing the options with which your opponent can attack you, right? And if you are literally just giving them your entire body and they can do whatever they want at any angle, then you've already denied yourself the ability to dictate some of that pace. Yeah, and you've denied yourself base. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've denied yourself mobility. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's important too in jujitsu too, because when you when you've got that staggered stance, like sometimes I I just when my opponent doesn't expect it, I want to just sit down. I, I like to play a lot of instep guard, and so sometimes I just want to sit down right in front of him and grab his leg. And it's way easier to do that if your stance is correct, because then you can just kind of like just butt drop basically right onto him and just grab his leg. Um, One thing that I think is worth talking about is uh, grip inversion. Now, we've talked about this previously that whenever someone gets a grip on you, you need to drop whatever you're doing and deal with that grip, Uh, assuming it's a dominant grip. I mean, some grips are useless, right? Some uh, you see this, especially with less experienced people that just grab onto something. So you've got hold it for possibly too long. Yeah. So you've got to know when a grip is actually effective or not. Um, If a grip is a dominant grip that can do something to you, meaning that they can use that to manipulate you or break your alignment, you've got to drop everything and deal with it right then and there before you attempt to pass or before you attempt to exert your game. A a common mistake is someone's got a dominant grip on you and you just try to ignore it and just try to pass their guard anyway. That's a real bad idea. I mean, probably the most obvious example of where this goes wrong is when someone's got like a spider guard hook on your bicep and you try to pass them and (laughs) you're like yeah like you that you can get enough pressure with just that one spider guard hook that they can just sweep you right so you gotta but sometimes it's more subtle than that right you always want to deal with the the grip before you try to pass Mm -hmm. now there's three strategies that I am aware of when it comes to inverting the grip. So let's say, okay, you've lost, you've lost the grip fight. Your opponent has, they've got the dominant grip on you. You need to deal with that right away. The most well-known strategy for dealing with the grip is grip breaking, right? Meaning I'm, I'm actually physically trying to break my opponent's grip on me. Um, usually the way that you're going to do this is you have to, if it's like, if it's a gi situation, there's going to be a lot of looseness when they're grabbing 
cutting your fabric, the first thing you have to do is you have to make that fabric tight. You can't make a grip if the piece of fabric is flapping around because there's too much give for your opponent. So you've got to, usually you have to grab the fabric itself and you have to make it tight and then you have to do a strong, sharp push or pull against the, the arm that's grabbing you. A mistake a lot of people make is they grab that arm and they pull and they pull and they pull and they try to do this like this big prolonged power pull like they're, you know, like they're a power lifter or something. But you don't want to do that. You want to do small bursts of force. You want it should be like a, like a like a whip cracking. Once you once you have taken the slack out of that gi grip, you want to just do a really sharp push or pull to break that grip. Yeah, and and grip fighting is it, it truly is an art on its own. Yes, and hand fighting is is an art on its own. Um, you, you, like I, I like what you said how you can't really break a grip if the if the cloth isn't tight. Mm-hmm. Another thing you can do is break a grip if your alignment is off. Yes, right? like so if you if you try and break a grip and your posture is off, you have way less ability to create that force than if you are posturing a lot a lot of the time you know if someone if i'm fighting judo with someone and they grab my my lapel and i grab a two-on-one on their sleeve and i go to break their grip it's not even so much about me pushing their grip away but also about how i'm posturing back yeah, you're pushing yourself away i'm right? pushing myself away and then you know uh to, to just add on to that as well i don't just want to abandon that grip you know if yes. i if i if i break that grip i want to keep that grip because now i have i've sort of jumped ahead in the sequence and now i have a sleeve grip so essentially you know when we're grip breaking we want to also collect grips and maintain those grips after we break them not just forget about them because you know if if you if you let go of that uh sleeve you've basically given them the ability to now regrip you yeah so so you 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 almost want to like put them in check by taking control of that lever so they don't have control of it yeah I, i would say that that is the number one mistake that people make with grip breaking which is they break the grip and then they just let their opponent get the same grip right again right and that that you don't want to do a grip break is only truly effective if you break the grip and then you manipulate the situation so that your your opponent cannot just regrip you usually this comes down to like you know you grab their hand and you push it at such an angle that they can't get your hand, they just can't get the grip back if you're just breaking the grip and then allowing your opponent to just regrip you all you're doing is burning effort and wasting time and that's not going to, to work in your favor now I, my personal feeling and I, I know a lot of people who agree with this is that grip breaking is not the be-all end-all it, it has significant limitations um, one problem with grip breaking is there is a physical factor Factor involved. Like if you, some people just have like gorilla hands, <laughs> uh, and especially if you're going up a weight class, you know, it sometimes you're just not realistically going to be able to break that grip. Yeah. Uh, the other problem with grip breaking is grip breaking to, to generate that kind of force. Usually if you're focusing on breaking the grip, you're probably exposing an, something else in the process. Like um, a lot of the time, if you're trying to break the grip, you're so focused on breaking the grip that you're exposing a leg or your other arm. And yeah, so, arm. yeah, so you're focused on grip breaking. And meanwhile, your opponent is busy arm dragging you or taking you down or something. So grip breaking is, is not the be all end all. Um, The other strategies that I use when it comes to um, inverting control of grips, the second one is is actual grip control inversion. So by this, I mean like rather than trying to break the grip, I try to swim on the inside or invert the situation so that now the grip pl- works in my favor and not in my yeah. opponents. There, There is um, like my, what my uh, business partner, Mike Lee, he has a, a Sayanagi that he likes to, uh, classically Sayanagi is from like the sleeve and collar grip mm-hmm. or a double sleeve grip. He does one where you're, you know, usually you try and fight for the inside grip in judo, yeah. but he does one where your opponent has the inside grip and he takes the outside grip uh, and grabs the collar. Kathy Hubble showed me this one. Yeah, it's actually my favorite way to do a Sayanagi as well. Yeah. And, and, it traps um, the arm really good. It traps the arm very good. So so you don't always have to break grips and understanding when you do and when you don't need to, it obviously just comes with experience, but sometimes grip breaking, it, you, you can actually let your partner have certain grips if you know that they're not going to play a factor depending on the the game plan that you're trying to impose yeah right a a common thing that i do uh kind of subconsciously when i roll is i know that my opponent has you know we we all have four four limbs in a head right four levers in a head the head is almost a lever but i i consider arms and legs different because you can grip with 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 your arms right and and the fact that there's more joints it changes that like they're they're, the head is a lever but you manipulate it differently from arms and legs exactly very difficult to grip someone with your head right sometimes you use your chin to uh to to 
to control someone, but but not when not in these situations. I mean, I guess you could bite them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you could bite them. Your, your, your feet also, like, even though you can't necessarily grab with your feet, you can still create hooks and clamps with your feet. So yes. in ways, you can grab with your feet. Yeah. So a lot of the time when, when I'm playing, like, say, an open guard with someone and we're fighting for grips or whatever... A lot of the time, I kind of have like a four and four rule going on in my head. And I know that if my opponent tries to grab my leg, if he grabs my leg, he's essentially winning the the battle. Like one of his limbs is taking one of my limbs out. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like that score game that we play with alignment, right? Mm -hmm. So I know that if I, if I can dominate a grip of his with my hands, or if I have like a, if I have two, two grips on his sleeves, then I know that I'm eliminating two of his, uh, two of his, uh, levers, right? And if I'm applying uh, different controls with my feet, maybe one's on his hip managing the distance, the other one's in like a, a De La Hiva or something like that, I know that I'm putting all of my limbs to use. Whereas if one of my arms is not doing anything, if it's just, and you'll see this a lot with beginners, they'll be trying to play open guards, but they'll forget to use a hand or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. And it's just out there doing nothing. Well, that's essentially not good jujitsu. Like you need to have assigned tasks to all of your limbs. They need yeah. to all be doing something. They need to all be manipulating levers or working towards breaking alignment, right? Yeah. So, so it's kind of something that you can do in your head. If someone if someone has a grip on you and you're wondering what to do next, usually it's address that grip or, you know, like you said, um, you want to nullify that, like if someone's grabbing my pant leg with their with their hand, I need to nullify that hand. How am I going to do that? Generally, I'll try and control that wrist so that now that grip can be, you know, a little bit less useful as I start yeah. to implement my next move. Yeah, it, you know, it's, it's funny you mentioned that too because that was a game changer for me when I realized that, you know, they, to, to be really effective from guard, you've got to be using all four of your your weapons your common weapons in unison and, yeah. and that that's kind of like you know it's like controlling a puppet you know you're we're used so used to just using our hands to do stuff but in jiu-jitsu when you learn to kind of use your legs like your hands that's when you kind of get to like blue belt and purple belt level when you can use them all just without thinking about it and you can coordinate them together i it's funny you mentioned this too about kind of thinking of the game of four because i actually i we've never talked about this but i think of it in very much the same way mm -hmm. where whenever i am attacking my opponent's guard I'm looking for ways to use all four of my weapons while taking away his weapons right yeah, and, and very exactly. subtle changes in angle allow you to do to do that just like how we think of alignment basically yeah, yeah. It's, it's really just an example of alignment it's a very yeah. specific example of alignment so yeah when it comes to how you invert control of that grip like you you know some ways that I like to do it are if my opponent has like a grip on my sleeve I again easiest way to do this is you just circle your hand onto the inside and you grip back and usually Usually, if you have your grip on the inside, you've got a bit more push-pull with them. The Seonagi example is, that you provided is a great one as well, because if you go over the person's arm from the outside, it results, in, it results in a nasty arm tra trap that makes it harder to escape. Uh, another thing, too, that I find is if, if I am on my butt and my opponent is standing up, you know, they're, they're always going to try to grab your feet. If you're playing gi and they're grabbing like your your pant fabric, often the easiest way to invert control of that grip is you just circle your leg around and you put your foot on their bicep and yeah. and you kind of clamp down with it. And now that grip is it's act as long as they continue to grab there, you're actually the one in control. Yeah, and eventually carrying all your weight. Yeah, and eventually they're going to have to let go of that. So that's that strategy of inverting control of the grip. I find to be more effective than breaking the grip. Another strategy and the third one that I use for dealing with grips is just completely changing the angle, right? Sometimes if, if you are in a position where you can move your body, and I, I mean, granted, if you're on bottom side control, you might be limited here. But if we're talking about the engagement phase, sometimes rather than trying to deal with the grip directly, you can just manipulate your whole body in such a way that the grip becomes irrelevant, right? Like a, a common example from the engagement phase is, uh, I, I don't know if there's a proper name for this, but I've heard it called the matrix dodge where someone tries to like grab your collar and you just kind of like do like the neo matrix dodge where you kind of lean to the side and turn your body around and trap their arm. Do you, mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Do you know that? Makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Maybe not to the extreme that Neo did it. But no. It makes, <laughs> it makes sense turning, basically turning the angle 
angle of your torso almost negates the grip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think essentially what you're doing is creating distance. Are you not you're, by doing that? You're you're changing the angle so so that by if your for if your opponent chooses and they persist to on keeping that grip, because you've turned to the side and leaned back a bit, you are now in a dominant angle because yeah. you're still looking at them, but they are now looking away from you as long as they choose to hold that grip. Yeah. The only way for them to get out of that is to let go of that grip. Yeah, there, there's there's some some interesting stuff that I've been playing with lately, and and a lot of it has been inspired by uh, Mikey Musumeki, who's like a really you know high level world champion black belt. He trains with Kyle Terra. Uh, the, he's got really good like nuanced movements with his wrist when he's doing different collar grips and sleeve grips, and and it makes a huge difference what you're doing with your wrists when you're playing open guards. So like for example, one thing that I've been doing that's really helping me is let's say I, I'll, I'll call, quite commonly I'll play De La Hiva guard with one foot on one hand on the foot and then the other hand on a collar grip and then I'll use that collar grip to kind of you know pull the opponent on top of me elevating them and then you know if I want to go for barambolo I can use that collar grip as well but but something I've been doing is I realized that I uh, you know, normally if you have the collar grip on someone, what they do is they, again, they'll stop what they're doing, they'll posture up, and then they'll try and get a two-on-one on that hand and immediately break that grip. Mm -hmm. So there's a few things I can do. One thing I've been doing is I know that in this, what I used to do in the moment was I would try and pull them on top of me, but I realized if I pull their collar towards me, it actually assists them with the grip break because yeah. what they want to do is create distance. They want to... And they want to take the slack out and by they, you pulling it, it takes the slack exactly. out. Exactly. Yeah. So so what I've been doing now is when I play this when I play this De La Hiva, if I can, I'll actually try and push the collar into them. Mm -hmm. What that does is it actually put uh, it it, uh, it puts slack into the into the cloth so that yeah. now they need to create even more space to, to break the grip. So they have to actually back up further. What this allows me to do sometimes is come up for single legs it allows me to continue uh, off balancing them for kazushi and do all types of different things so but by sometimes taking that grip and pushing it into them for a moment uh it, it breaks their ability to break that grip like you said because it doesn't it, it creates slack mm -hmm. um <clears throat> And another thing I'm doing when I realize that if, let's say I have the collar grip and I re, you know, they grip up and I feel like, okay, these, this guy's about to break my grip. I let it go because, yeah. because sometimes the worst thing you can do is try and hold on really tight and then they break that grip out of your hand and your it does damage to your fingers. Yeah. And now we actually have to regrip again anyways. And now your fingers hurt. <laughs> and now your fingers hurt. So it'd be, it'd be a smarter way to, to appro uh, approach the sequence where if you have a grip mm -hmm. that you can discard that grip and immediately regrip something else before your opponent takes yeah. control of your arm. This is actually a, a, a like a paradigm shift that people need to realize when we're talking about the engagement phase. Uh, unlike the other phases of guard, in the engagement phase, you should have basically unrestricted movement because by definition, you haven't engaged yet, right? So you can't necessarily do, always do this from the other phases, but in engagement, it, it is always an option to bail out or to sit down or to stand up. So if things aren't going your way with the engagement phase, you can always just break, take a step back and then retry. That can also be unbelievably frustrating for your opponent, all right? Like, especially if they have a game they want to play and they're about to get their grip and you just br you, you break or you invert and you just back off and then you re-engage. I have actually found that uh, now granted, you know, I am I am a filthy casual. I do <laughs> I do not compete, but I have found with a lot of people, I don't even need to take them down because if I do that stand up, they will eventually get so frustrated they'll just sit down and be like, "Okay, fine. I'm going to go to my my comfort zone. I'm going to go to my happy place here." Yeah. And so sometimes if you can sh demonstrate to a person that your engage your domination of the engagement phase is so strong that they have no chance of actually taking you down, they'll just see the position on their own and just sit down. Yeah, unless unless they're, you're going with like a high level wrestler who's just like, okay, let's mix it up. Yeah, um, <laughs> in which case maybe you yeah. should sit down. <laughs> I've, I've been dealing with some uh, some different knee injuries lately, and it's an ongoing struggle for you know for mo a lot of competitors and a lot of practitioners. But mm -hmm. what I've had to do is sort of limit my sparring time. But I've kind of said, okay, well, I kind of refuse to just stay stagnant. I want to continue to grow. So what I've been doing is we've in class gi and no gi, we've been just sitting basically cross-legged from each other and grip fighting as a warm-up for the first 20 minutes mm -hmm. and literally just fighting for two-on-ones fighting for sleeve and collar and uh, if you can hold that position for three seconds then you basically win the hand fighting 
um, exercise. So it's it's a really great way if, if you're an instructor and you're listening to this to just do it for like a week or you know do it do it over the course of a month maybe a few times a week with your students. It really sets uh, the idea that we need to win grip fights mm-hmm. and um, it's very un- un- like it's not a stressful exercise because there's it's no- actually a lot of fun. It's easy on the body. You it's do- easy on the body. It's a lot of fun and if you have lower body injuries it's a great way to continue your uh, progression because mm-hmm. you can never get enough grip fighting right yeah, and yeah. and and um you'll you'll notice that the students that have excellent understanding of engagement phase and grip fighting they're going to dictate a lot of what happens when they're in a match so definitely i think hand fighting is is one of the most important exercises you can do whether mm-hmm. you're whether you're focusing a class on it or just as a warm-up yeah i've heard, you know a lot of people call you call this target and sparring but i think matt one of the things that you know you emailed me about the other day was uh, you know the concept of like handicapping your training to focus on specific areas of weakness and this is something that uh, I actually taught a while ago when we did a, a class on the engagement phase which is uh, basically just targeted sparring the engagement phase and saying hey look we're not trying to necessarily pass the guard here our objective in training is you two are not touching you go for a grip fight and as soon as someone establishes a dominant grip you reset and you do it again there's no passing it's just the goal is to get the dominant grip and that kind of sparring allows you to work on areas of the game that are generally neglected such as the engagement phase and yeah to your point like I, I have found that the one of my best options for beating a, someone who is like a lot better or more experienced than me, my best option is if I if I am better than them at the engagement phase, I can get a lot more mileage out of my experience. E, you know, even if they are technically better than me in every other way. If you can beat someone on the engagement phase, it's really hard for them to then because they have to start playing catch up. And even if they're technically more proficient than you in every other area of the game, a person who's good at the engagement phase can still manage to defeat you so it's something that you really need to focus on and doing handicapped sparring is a good way to do it yeah a great example of of uh hand fighting and engagement phase in a nogi con uh uh, Nogi situation is going to be Eddie Cummings and this guy is you know some people are always like how does this guy like do the leg locks he does like how is he so excellent at leg locks well number one his mechanics are just like probably the best in the world at leg locks but but his entries and his um you know, some people don't like his style, actually. Some people say that his style is is boring or whatever, but it's because he's so frugal, frugal and because he refuses to essentially uh, progress in the match unless he wins that that hand fight. Mm-hmm. As soon as he wins the hand fight, a lot of the time he gets right in on his leg entanglement. So you'll you'll see like the, a lot of the time his opponents lose before he even submits them. They lose when he gets his hand fight and then he uh, he wins the hand fight and then he gets into his ashigarami of choice, right? And then quickly you see the the leg entanglement happen and the, his opponent taps. So um, that was a big inspiration for Rob and also myself see, with our leg lock system, like seeing how you get to these positions. It's always winning the hand fight positions is usually how you enter different ashigarami and making your your leg lock game successful yeah yeah um the entries you know when we talk about engagement that doesn't just mean stand up and or, or even just grip fighting a lot of it is how you enter your leg entanglements and this for me was a challenge when i started moving more towards that kind of game you know it hey once you get into like a, you know a good leg entanglement yeah you can do some stuff but it can be very hard to get in there safely without your opponent just passing your guard and that that's really a variant of the engagement phase it and there's a lot of strategies for doing that but the the trick is much like we've talked about earlier you want to deny your opponent the ability to dictate the pace you want to deny them the ability to establish a dominant grip on you if your opponent does get a dominant grip on you um, and, and again in nogi the way you do that it can be quite different is usually like lever control but you want to deal with that and then back out and reset before you go back in like it's a constant game of uh, when you're dealing with engagement of resetting and back when it's not going well and backing out and then going back in and if it doesn't go well you reset and you just keep doing that and yeah if your opponent is not particularly skilled with the engagement phase that level of frustration can be so demoralizing that sometimes they'll just wind up giving up the position I found or they'll just seed whatever game you want because they get frustrated yeah and and from the perspective of a person on top possibly passing the guard in the engagement phase um, 
you basically want to avoid your opponent's engagement in certain ways. Like so, sometimes one of my favorite passing strategies in training is um, instead of instead of even grip fighting, what I'd like to do is sort of hover around the outside and wait for my opportunity, whether I'm going to create use some footwork to create a different angle or, or create a different range by moving in and out. I kind of want to hover around the outside and then create almost like a blitz style pass yeah. where, where maybe I've got grips or maybe I've just put push their legs to the side and now I'm I've I've created a, a lane that I can start to pass and my opponent hasn't gripped yet. So, you know, if I if I can essentially what I'm trying to talk about is is uh, skipping the engagement phase and going right to the third phase, right? Like if I can if I can uh, You mean skipping the maintenance phase, right? Uh, well, yeah, sk- so, yeah, sk- yeah, skipping. Uh, well, skipping the engagement phase like all the way through. Like I don't I want should, them to grip and me. And going right all. to retention. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like if I can, if I can get a chest to chest situation from, uh, from like a standing position and going right into that chest to chest position, my my opponent on the bottom is essentially only framing, and that's mm-hmm. creating that dilemma, that tempo mm-hmm. concept where now you're free to kind of move around. And generally, what I'll do is go to north south, right? Mm-hmm. Just keep transitioning mm-hmm. until I can settle down yeah yeah. Uh, that that i think is one of the best ways to look at guard passing as opposed to like entering your partner's guard yeah just wandering in yeah if you enter your partner's guard then you give them a way better chance but if you maintain distance and sort of pick and choose how you're going to enter and then hopefully you can (laughs) enter in a really offensive quick situation that's going to prevent them from using a lot of their gripping power you know it's it's so funny you mentioned this because i just taught this uh, a while ago and the way i kind of explained it was like the easy much like how at the beginning of the episode to tie it all back up we talked about how you know prevention is is was it an ounce of prevention prevention is worth a pound of cure yeah it's the same thing here the easiest way to pass the guard is not to get stuck in the guard in the yeah. first place. Like, don't go in the guard. Yeah, don't don't go into that guard. Like, it, there's no rule written down saying that if your opponent is like sitting on the ground that you just need to like wander blindly into their guard. Yeah. If you can just kind of, for lack of, I mean, it doesn't sound technical, but if you can just kind of meander around them, you can skip that whole phase. Like, you know, if your opponent is sitting there in butterfly or whatever, you don't just want to wander in and just like give them your your leg. That's kind of like walking into a bear trap. You know, yeah. you're better off just walking around them. And this ties into that four uh, that four on four game we talked about earlier when I'm in there's and when you're when you're you've got that situation where your opponent is sitting on the ground and you're standing up um, controlling the distance matters because if you get too close the four on four game starts working in your disadvantage right because if, if I walk right into my opponent's guard well now he's got one, at least one of my legs maybe one of my arms maybe both of my legs while still maintaining control of all of his limbs if I'm too far then neither of us have a distinct advantage and either of us can just get up or do whatever. But if I'm in that mid range, there's like that sweet spot when you're on the top and your opponent is sitting where I can use my hands to grab their legs, but they cannot use anything to grab me. That's the sweet spot when you're passing guard. If you're too close, they can start entangling you and tying you up and taking away your weapons. If you're too far, no one has an advantage, but there's that Goldilocks zone where like I can use my hands to grab your, if to grab your feet, or if you're sitting up, I can grab your head or in your arms, mm-hmm. but you can grab nothing of mine. That yeah. when you're passing guard, get into that middle range first because that allows you to much more easily win the engagement phase. Mm-hmm. And a few things for for people that like to play the seated guard. A few things to think about is you know if your feet are dangling past your hands, then you're kind of giving your opponent access to your feet, right? So you yeah, want to yeah, yeah. you want to have your hands uh, s- outstretched. F- getting ready to fight any levers that are coming in to manipulate your feet and uh, your hands should always be ahead of your feet your feet should be tucked in and also you, you should also be watching their hands and sort of anticipating that those hands are going to make moves either on your your pant legs or on your head right or mm-hmm. or both which is really bad because now they have rotational control they can kind of spin you and, and do like uh, you know like X style passes so mm-hmm. so you really need to make sure that you're monitoring their wrists and, and getting ready to grab a two on one on that wrist or at least a grip on that wrist so that they can't spin you they can't pull your head down and posture up uh, break your posture and enter and they definitely can't you know the one of the worst cases would be if they grab the ends of your legs and start like a stack pass situation yeah, yeah, that's yeah. somewhere you don't want to be too so if you're on the bottom a lot of the time i just sort of imagine that i'm like a <laughs> i'm like a fighter pilot like and and the wrists are basically the bogeys and i'm trying to pick them out of midair right i really like that analogy yeah, like and, and it works because i'm 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 focused in on just their hands right i know that he can't really grab me with his feet 
and he can't grab me with his head. But I, if I pay attention to what the hands are doing, I should be able to win the engagement phase or at least man it, not get my guard passed. If I kind of ignore what the hands are doing and I try and get like a an instep guard where I'm just like, you know, like grabbing their leg, bear hugging their leg. You're probably giving up your neck if nothing else, yeah, right? Yeah, their hands are free to do anything they want, right? So I've sort of modified my game to, to really pay attention to my partner's hands from the bottom. Yeah, yeah. So um, anything else you want to add on the topic, Matt, or should we wrap it up? Uh, just just reiterate that, yeah, like, you know, if, if you are an instructor out there, just take some time and really talk about the importance and um, and the, the, the necessity of hand fighting with your, with your uh, students and definitely implement some grip fighting strategies if you're not. Because otherwise, if you're not, you're really denying them and you're denying yourself a, a big area of growth i think what this is one of my big one of my biggest um when people when people tell me like oh this guy's really good or he pa- he's a really quick pass or he passes my guard quick or this guy's really big right how do i deal with this bigger guy how do i deal with this faster guy how, how do i deal with the stronger guy? The, my answer is almost always win the grip fight mm-hmm. so if you can if you can implement a strong grip fighting game and you're you're you know you understand how to just keep managing the distance and making space and, and forcing your opponent to enter on your terms. Like that's going to solve so many problems for people that constantly are getting their guard passed. Generally, generally if you're getting your guard passed, it's because you're losing this phase of guard. So, Mm -hmm. um, emphasis on this phase of guard and, uh, you know, next time we're going to talk about how you can maintain your guard. Yeah, yeah. I think that one of the easiest ways to turbocharge your guard really quickly is to focus on improving your engagement capabilities because this is usually the most underserved and undertrained area of guard. As, as mentioned earlier, I think a lot of instructors do a disservice to their, their students by not focusing on this. I do suggest that everyone spend some time specifically targeting and training this phase of guard, the, basically the first contact phase because it so much dictates what's going to happen later on, right? Whoever wh- whoever wins the engagement phase really does get to dictate the pace, and that's going to affect almost everything else that happens from then on out. Yeah, and if you if you plan on ever having a successful open guard, like a spider guard or whatever, any variation of spider guard or Delahiva, you have to understand engagement yeah. phase battles. You can't; uh, those are like grip based guards, right? So you can't really utilize those guards without understanding how to get their uh, effect. You'll never get to a strong Delahiva guard where you can now off balance your opponent if you don't know how to get there effectively, right? We don't want to wait for them to engage our guard. We want to make sure that our guard is imposing our game on them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just to quickly recap what we talked about today, uh, there are three phases of guard. The first phase is engagement, meaning you're making first contact with your opponent, usually a grip fight. Second phase is maintenance, meaning you're in the guard or you have guard and you and your opponent are jockeying for position and to to break the other person's alignment and to begin passing. The third phase is retention, meaning your opponent has is either passed or is in the process of passing your guard. Generally, this means they have moved past your legs and you are now attempting to either regard or uh, either otherwise recover the position and reset. Uh, it, that's So phases of guard being the first mental model that we've talked about, a, a big part of that is controlling the distance. So we talked about how in the engagement phase, if you're the one on the attack, there's kind of that Goldilocks zone where you want to be close enough that you can grab your opponent, but far enough that they can't grab you. We talked about tempo or, you know, also known as dictating the pace. Whoever the person or whichever person is able to dictate the pace is going to force their opponent into a reactive mode and will probably have the advantage. We talked about training training with purpose, meaning you don't necessarily want to go into a competition or a fight with the same mindset that you had when you were training. You want to consciously understand what your game plan and your strategy and mindset are going to be. We talked about mindfulness, so being able to objectively step out of the situation and identify whether your current strategy is continuing to work and change on the fly. A lot of that in the context of engagement means being willing to back out or to stand up and to reset rather than to persist. We talked about grips dictating position, meaning whoever wins the grip fight is probably going to, you know, they could wind up actually winning the entire fight in a lot of cases. We talked about minimizing the attack vectors, so changing your angle so that your opponent has limited options as to what they can grip on your body. 
We talked about coiling your limbs, so keeping your arms and your legs, uh, you know, coiled in so that your opponent cannot easily arm or leg drag you. You really only want to extend a limb out when you're doing it for the purpose of generating force and, and you're doing it in a way that you're confident your opponent cannot then take control of you. We talked about uh, the strategies for inverting grips, the first one being breaking the grip, the second one being swimming and in taking control of the grip so that it no longer benefits your opponent, and the third one being just moving and changing the angle of your body so that the grip is no longer actually effective. And then the last thing we talked about is handicapping. So, you know, basically changing and targeting your sparring, eliminating areas of the game so that you can focus on the areas where you are weakest, that you Usually here in the context of today, if you're talking about guard, it's probably going to be the engagement phase where you're weakest. So good summary of the episode, good chat. Uh, instead of talking about questions, I wanted to maybe comment on some of the feedback that we received. So a lot of people actually have reached out and talked about data in the context of jujitsu. It has come to my attention that a lot of people really, really kind of micromanage their game and they track, you know, and they take extensive notes and they record exactly what they what they do and don't do and where their successes are. I actually had several people reach out to me and send me like these detailed Excel spreadsheets of like all of the moves <laughs> that they've done, which is on one hand, you know, ultra, psychopathic. Yeah. On the one hand, it's like, it's like very, very like just an insane level of detail. But on the other hand, if it works for you, then it works for you. I mean, people, people learn in different ways. Um, I tend to be on the, the type of person that likes to record and document everything, but even I don't go to that level of, that's uh, impressive. Yeah. That is it's impressive more than anything else. Uh, I would say that if you're interested in that kind of data driven jujitsu approach, there are places that are starting to do this and, and pull this data. Uh, the one that I've become aware of, there is a site called high percentage martial arts and they basically do like data breakdowns of different strategies that do or don't work in competition I think there are other sites that do that as well so if you are interested in kind of the, the big data approach to jujitsu you might want to google it because there are some people now who are actually starting to like compile competition stats to talk about what does and does not work in the martial art yeah another one uh, that I've I've discovered recently is called Bishop BJJ and it's a BJJ study and statistics website so you know if you're if you're wondering um, as a competitor how you can make your game more effective you can go to this website and it'll essentially tell you like oh this percentage of people that pull guard uh, win matches and it's a higher percentage <laughs> but, yeah. but uh, you know like you'll you'll see that like if you get your guard passed in a match your chances of winning are like one yeah. percent so so really important statistics that can help you become a better competitor and just a uh, uh, a, f a way that you can design a, a, an effective framework for your game, right? And make it make it uh, a fact statistic, statistic based strategy so that you can, uh, you know, get the edge yeah. of competition. I mean, statistics are not the be all and end all, but they're important to know because Matt, like you said, I mean, if, if you're telling me that like 99% of people who get their guard passed go on to lose, I mean, on one hand, that's not entirely surprising, not at but, all. but on the other hand, it totally drives home the importance of what we covered today. Yeah. Why, why are they getting their guard passed? Not because they don't have good guard escapes. Because but, they're losing the engagement phase. Yeah, they, they fell into the hole and now they're digging themselves out. Exactly. Whereas the top players don't fall into the hole in the first place. Yeah. That kind of data is very important to know. Now, do you need to go out of your way to record all of this data on yourself? Um, I mean, not necessarily, but I do think that at the bare minimum, you should have some data on yourself. Uh, and probably the easiest way to do that is to get someone to record what you're doing and watch it back. Yeah. And, and that will really drive home... Uh, Probably it will show things to you about yourself that you didn't realize. At the bare minimum, that kind of feedback, uh, you know, recording your own uh, your own training sessions is very useful. You know, mm -hmm. I, I can tell you as, as an example, this podcast is one of the first times that I have recorded and listened to myself talk. And man, I have learned a lot of things about the way that I speak that I didn't <laughs> realize. Was, there, there were a lot of things that I noticed, like I didn't realize I say that all the time. But I've in this podcast, I've said this exact same stupid phrase like 10 times. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that kind of feedback can be very powerful and, and helpful. And at the bare minimum, I mean, you don't need to track everything in an Excel sheet unless it's helping you. But at the bare minimum, I do suggest, number one, 
take some recordings of your training sessions or, or comp footage, of course. Uh, and number two, uh, check out those websites that we talked about. So Bishop BJJ and the other one that I found was High Percentage Martial Arts. They're good resources that give some, I mean, they're not really like, you know, scientific level quality research as far as I can tell, but it's a good start. And it gives you an idea of what a big data looks like when it comes to jujitsu. Yep. And, and of course, you know, just asking your training partners and your coaches, like things that you can do better, being receptive to the criticism and also making notes is a great way to just document what you're doing right, what you could do better and strategies for what you could do better. Yeah. And, and one thing we didn't talk about today, actually, Steve, was, was engagement phase uh, victory leading to submission, which yeah. we didn't even talk about that. We're just talking about like in terms of passing the guard. But a great example I can think of would be like Edwin Najmi, who basically as soon as he gets called grips will go for flying attacks flying triangles yeah. things like this so definitely check out Edwin Najmi if you want to see someone who's an expert at the engagement phase uh, who uh, instead of passing the guard just goes right to a submission and is very often uh, victorious yeah it's a, it's an option for sure I mean it's not for everybody but yeah, there's, there's risks no, there's no denying that some people are exceptionally good at just like immediately going right into like a flying sub yep Awesome. Well, great chat, Matt. Thank you so much for that. I, I hope that was helpful. Again, this is going to be the first of a three episode series. Next week, we're going to talk about guard maintenance. Take care, guys. Take care, guys. Thank you.